to a three-game slump. Is there an end to the losing streak in sight? Hello and hola to everyone y todos. Welcome back to the number one weekly and bilingual Inter-Miami-focused podcast that provides you with all the latest news, analysis, opinions, inside information, general punditry, and much more via a team of seasoned reporters. My name is Franco Panizo and I am one of the weekly co-hosts of this South Florida-based show, which is called Miami. Total. Football. Radio. <laughs> Where the beautiful game collides with passion and analysis. And that voice you just heard at the end there saying our beloved radio is none other than the returning Jose Armando, a.k.a. Island Jose, a.k.a. if some people still refer to him as Cinco. Well, there you go. Also known as Cinco. Jose, it's been a few weeks since you've been on, so I'm starting with you. We're not even going to get into anything else. Starting with you, how are you doing? Where have you been? Welcome back. Well, very excited to be back. It's been a while. I did my Inter-Miami homework. I have all my information ready for the pod. Um, I- I've been working Nations League. You know, it's been it's been exciting in the last few days and, and some other stuff, uh, working around, um, you know, baseball. Uh, the Marlin season is getting back on track. And, of course, um, the Miami Open. So a lot of things going on in South Florida, but I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk into Miami. I know things are not going the way when I left you guys. You know, it was it was uh, everything was smooth. The team was near first place and I leave the pod and here we are. So it's on you guys, really. Well, you said it's been, you know, good for you, especially, you know, with Nations League and all the work you've had. But if you're a Honduran, I don't know if you can say that because it didn't go too well for Honduras recently. Sorry, I have, I have to, we have to be honest on this Cup, podcast. We are in the Gold Cup. <laughs> oh, congratulations! I don't want to. I don't even want to bring Peru because congratulations for, for, <laughs> for making it to the Gold Cup. That's such a hard, hard task. Something Honduras has never strived to do before in its history. Anyway. No. For for Peru, I think it went well. The boxing match in the in the, in the lobby, right? Yeah, yeah, that was fine. There we fine. go. Here yeah. we go. All right, all right. <laughs> better and better around the Peruvian national team. All right, all right, all right. You two, let's go to Andreita, aka Ajisita, more formally known as Andrea Yanes. Andrea, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to be here discussing everything that happened with Inter Miami. Maybe Jose is the good luck charm for for the team because maybe now that he's back, the team can get a win this week. And if that is the case, then Franco and I are the salt. Or maybe Miguel, who was on the podcast last week, is the salt because he also returned from a trip. And and went to the stadium and the team lost again. So I was bothering him. He was the the bad luck for the team, but <clears throat> ready to talk about everything that we saw, everything that we heard, and every interesting thing that we have to say about Inter Miami. And when she says the salt, it's because in Spanish we say la sal or el salado, which means just like the unlucky one or the bad luck, so the bad luck charm. So that's what she refers to when she's talking about herself or myself or Miguel. By the way, very quickly, before we get to the football fun, Jose, I heard a secret about you, that you're a big, big, or used to be a big house music fan and used to go to Ultra every year, which I went for the first time in 14 years this past Friday. It didn't go on You're Saturday cool. or Sunday, but the first time. No, first time in fourteen years. It's been a while. I had gone when I was younger, but I just hadn't gone in a long time. But I heard you were a big house music fan. Is this is this true? Can you confirm these reports? Yeah, I can confirm. I still, I'm, I'm still a big fan. I mean, that's that's my favorite type of music. Although uh, I'm, you know, I'm I'm an open minded person when it comes to music. I I can listen everything. So, but I do like a lot. I really enjoyed my time um, at Ultra, but. You know, I got older, then I have responsibilities, other than to pay for the ticket, right? Which is, by the way, very expensive. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, but I, it's true. It's true. It's true. And okay. I still have, well, I, I, I think it's it must be even better now than what it was like 10 years ago when I went for the last time. So uh, I'm sure you had a good time. I did have a good time. I had a great time. Uh, I wish I could have gone the whole weekend, but duty called. Had an Inter-Miami game to go watch on Saturday. And 
Well, we'll dive into all of what happened in that game, which ended in a frustrating and disappointing home loss, a rare home loss for the South Florida side. So we'll dive into that. We'll dive into the individual performances in there, including Nicola Stefanelli up top, DeAndre Yedlin uh, at right back, and a bunch of other different topics regarding the game. We will also talk about whether the team has become a little bit too attack-minded. We'll talk about Phil Neville's post-game comments. And, well, we'll get to them in a moment where, you know, he he wasn't too uh, pleased with, I guess, the, the post-game remarks from Chicago Fire head coach Ezra Hendricks, Hendrickson. And, of course, we'll preview this upcoming weekend's game against FC Cincinnati on the road as well as do the Q&A session and the final thoughts at the very end. So we've got a lot to talk about. Let's get to it. All right, let's dive right into it. Inter-Miami returned home after a two-game road swing that ended with two straight defeats. So they get back to Drive Pink Stadium on Saturday night, this past Saturday night, and they fall 3-2 to two to the Chicago Fire. It was the Chicago Fire's first win of the 2023 regular season. Now, Chris Mueller and Carlos Teran scored in the 30th and 38th minutes for the fire. Inter-Miami responded. They got a lifeline right before halftime through. Left back Franco Negri, who scores his first goal for the South Florida side. Then, Nicola Stefanelli gets on the end of a cross from Franco Negri. Stefanelli scores his first uh, goal in MLS and for Inter-Miami in the 76th. But in second half stoppage time, in the 92nd, Kai Kamara proves to be the hero for the fire, the villain for Inter Miami. He scores, and that's all she wrote in this one. A late victory for the fire, a late loss for Inter Miami. This was the starting lineup Inter Miami went with, noting that Joseph Martinez and Robert Taylor were away due to international duty. So it was a 4 2 3 1. Drake Callender in goal, DeAndre Yedlin at right back, Sergio K. Kristoff at the right center back spot, Christopher McVeigh at the left center back, and Franco Negri again out on the left flank. The first line of the midfield, Gene Mota and Victor Ulloa. Second line of the midfield, Corentin Jean, Bryce Duke at the 10, and Rodolfo Pizarro on that left side. Up top, as number nine, Nicolas Stefanelli. All right. A lot to dissect go about this one. It's a lot, a lot, a lot. So, let's just start with the overall impressions. We will start with the returning Jose. What did you think of the game overall? We will dive into the late goal. We will dive into the overall performance in more detail. But just your quick overall biggest takeaways from this game. I thought it was just uh, uh, disappointing. I think that's that's the first thing that I would say. It was just a disappointing performance. Um, because um, you would expect this team after dropping two games on the road to come come home and 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 get back to what we saw in the first two games, right? Um, I, I still think it's early for this team, but you know it was just it was just disappointing. They they just couldn't uh, prove to be the better team that night against the Chicago Fire team that um, they were missing important players due to the um, the international window, which, yes, Inter Miami, they were missing some players as well, but um, I-, I thought they still had enough, you know, to, to prove that they are, they are a better team than, than the Chicago Fire. Maybe they are, but they just had, they just didn't have a good night. They weren't the better team on the night. That's, that's for certain. Andrea, your quick thoughts on the game. You were there next to me in the press box, so we watched the game together. What are your thoughts now that you've had a couple of days to dissect and marinate on what happened on Saturday night? I agree with Jose that it was a missed opportunity for the team to to come back after losing two games on the road and keeping up that. Um, I don't know if. Um, yeah, I think it's earned that that is a fama, like we say in Spanish, that they are a strong team team. In, in their house, but unfortunately they didn't. They didn't show that. Um, I think, um, in my personal opinion, Phil did a mistake because even though he was missing his uh, striker, he, he tried to play with the same uh, tactical formation. And I don't think that helped the team. And when he realized the game changed, um, he did some good uh, adjustments 
But after that, <clears throat> they were not consistent. They were not uh, uh, consistent enough to to bring the game and Chicago Fire to bring the game the at least a tie. And Chicago Fire took advantage of that. Listen, he uh, for me, uh, Chicago's Fire coach won this game because of his tactics, and he read the game correctly. He brought in Kate Camara, and that is why he he got the three points at the end. So I will go off of something you just said, Andrea, that for my biggest you know takeaway, and I guess it's a little remix of yours and Jose's, and that's that Inter Miami was not the better team in this game. I could hear the argument that both teams were pretty even. I could hear that. But Inter Miami at home against a winless team, you would expect a better performance and better performance levels. Now, I agree with you, Andrea, that I think Phil Neville was outcoached in that first half. I do think that. Because Inter Miami wasted the first half. They got a goal late, and that's what gave them a lifeline. But besides that, they did not play particularly well. You didn't. They didn't look like... A dominant home team like we expect them to play the second half was a completely different story and they they were on top of a Chicago fire they were threatening looked a lot more threatening but the first half was wasted it was 45 minutes largely wasted the Inter Miami goes down in a 2-0 hole which not something you would have drawn up or expected uh going into it I mean I I couldn't have predicted that um I didn't predict that I thought this was a, a very winnable game for Inter Miami and they ended up dropping it now we'll dive into the tactics and the X's and O's here. But let's start with the late Kamara goal. Let's start there. Because that's the decisive blow and it dooms and remind me to its first defeat of 2023 at DraftKings Stadium and third overall. So for me, I think Phil Neville there got it wrong. I think the team was a little too... I don't know if the word frantic, but a little too aggressive in trying to go for the winner. And I get it. You're trying to win at home. You don't want to drop points at home. You're pushing. But you have to push in a smart way. And Inter Miami on the play does not push in a smart way. Because the ball goes to Benjamin Kramashi, who had come in as a substitute. And he tries to chest the pass into the path of DeAndre Yedlin. The pass is intercepted and quickly leads to a counterattack. And that counterattack leads to a low cross to the back post for Kai Kamara. Good low finish. Thought Drake Callender should have done better, though, because it is to the near post. That's it. That's the game. That's the difference. Now, on the low cross, Inter Miami's clearly, because how many numbers they were trying to push forward, they don't have great coverage. They don't have great solidity going the other way. Like, they weren't well positioned to deal with the attack. And that's why Kai Kamara's all by himself. Yedlin's trying to... To catch up, he's making a run in behind. I think he was exhausted. I, I think Yedlin, towards the 70th minute, if not earlier, was was already winded. Uh, I believe they said he did not train on the broadcast. They said he did not train all week um, as he was tending to his wife and their newborn. So he looked winded to me. It makes sense to me that he wasn't able to to get back there like he normally would. And I know people are you know trying to point the finger at him for two of the three goals because he's trailing the play. But that's because he's being asked to get forward into the attack so much. And I think that that's on Phil Neville as much as it is the player. Because you can't expect him to be at both ends. Yes, he has to track back. Yes, he has to try to help put out the fire. But you can only do so much. You can't be at both places at once all the time. So for me, I thought they got a little too uh, too careless in the attack. But that's just my opinion. What did you guys think? We'll go back to Andrea first. For me, this loss is, is on the coach. He's on the coach more than what any individual player could could we could say we could say here Yedlin is is at fault. We could say here that the second goal for me is worse than any mistake Yedlin did because how a central defender a central mm-hmm. defender that and is a central defender could get between two of your defenders and win the ball. <laughs> get a shot, then get the rebound and score a goal. It's unacceptable. But other than pointing for for mistakes, I think that that, that was uh, basically the, the mistake this game. Uh, Phil, he, he ended up paying. The team ended up paying also because they don't have any, they didn't have any debt in the, in, 
in the players that they brought in, but because of the injuries also, they're missing uh, Campana, Ascona, and other interesting players that could bring a, anything different that Miami would have needed to win this game. Because it's not like Chicago was that demolishing team, but they did just to, to get the three points. Uh, yeah, I'm going to disagree with you both because I'm not going to blame the coach for looking for uh, to win a game, especially at home. So if you're, if you're going to have to take chances and um, against one of the worst teams in the league, I think you have to go for three points. And yes, there's there's a risk. You know, there's there's a risk in, in, in a lot of things that Inter Miami is doing this year. Like, you know, you can we, we can we can talk about the young players that are coming in in the second half. You know, they're they're gonna have good games, but they're gonna have ups and downs throughout the season. So that's taking a risk as well. You know? Um, I'm sure this is not this this will not be the last game in which Inter Miami brings Borgelin. Ruiz, Cremachi, all those young guys that just a few months ago were playing for for uh, uh, for Inter Miami too, and now they're having the responsibility to close out a game. Like the similar scenario with Bryce Duke. Bryce Duke didn't have a good game at all, but, you know. But he's he he has a little bit of more experience, but he doesn't have that much other than the go, the guys that I just mentioned. So well, talking about that, you now that you mention it, and I don't want to let it pass. Why do you leave Bryce Duke if he had the game that he's having, and you take down Pizarro? That is the coach's responsibility. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really uh, agree with the decision. I agree with that under that they left Bryce Duke in this one, and he did not have a good game, and I, I don't think Pizarro was spectacular either but i thought he was a little sharper a little bit better than than duke um so i i was confused i was a little confused by that one if you were looking to win the game you need a little bit of uh, more experience guys especially because you brought ruiz you brought Cremarchi, and you brought borgelin that are not as experienced so you need to keep at least at least men that have that experience on the field so well duke is- was duke was struggling from the get-go yes. from the get-go i think i think it didn't help him at all not to have a presence at the top a, a player that he knows okay i'm gonna look for him uh making this run or he's gonna wait for me you know somebody that he knows can can understand they, they can have a, a um a, a way of communicating even without without talking to each other, you know, I think Duke already knows the way that Campana likes the ball, where he likes it, where he doesn't like it, and um, obviously with with Stefanelli uh, playing out of position, and I'm gonna say that up out of position, even though I know he has played before as a nine, mm-hmm. he looked like he was playing out of position. He didn't look like a nine. So um, I think that connection was not there. And yes, it was probably a mistake from Phil to keep him on the field. Um, but I don't think Pizarro is that superstar. I think no, I, the, I don't yeah, think yeah, yeah. He's, he's not a superstar. But I think he's you, not yeah, you should, superstar. based on what you're seeing on the field. <laughs> yeah. Based on what you're seeing on the field, I think you got to keep Pizarro in based on what you're seeing yeah. in the game. It's just my my perspective through my lens, through where I was sitting. And I, yeah, yeah. I rewatched the game. I think Pizarro should have stayed on the field just based on el rendimiento, the Why performance bringing, levels yeah. of what you're seeing on the field. Bryce Duke was having a poor game, and he had a bad game. And he didn't do anything extra or spectacular during that final stretch while he was in. And they put him at the 10, then they moved him back to the first uh, line of the midfield to try to help with the build-out, and he just didn't make an impact. He didn't have a good game. And I, I don't know, I mean, I, I can understand the reasons why Phil Neville kept him in, but I don't agree with those reasons. But anyway, that's, the, the, the team didn't lose this game because... You know, Bryce Duke was in instead of Pizarro. Like, going back to the goal, I think, and I've said this before earlier in the season, before the season even started, actually, I think Phil Neville has gone completely the opposite way of what he was a year ago. When he was very defensive-minded and we were being critical of the team for being so defensive-minded, I think now he's gone to el otro extremo, to the other extreme. Now I think he's become too attack-minded, and that is leaving the defense exposed. Like, we'll talk about the personnel. We'll talk about Stefanelli as a nine in, in a moment. But, but, but you have to do it against the Chicago Fire at home. Jose, Jose. You don't have to do it again against the Chicago Fire at Jose, home. Jose, do you remember what Phil Neville said last year, Jose? Do you remember what Phil Neville said at one point last season? I think it was early on. 
Oh, actually, it was, I think it was before the season began. It was after his first season in charge. And and going towards the second season, he said at some point, I don't know if it was you know, postseason after 2021 or early preseason 2022. But at some point there, he said, we didn't tie enough games in 2021. That's what he said. He's like, and you know, if we can't win games, then we have to not lose games. At least get something out of the game. So I get it. I get it. And you're at home. You're against the Chicago Fire or not who haven't won a game yet. I don't I'm not saying you don't attack, but I'm saying you gotta do it in a much smarter and composed fashion. I thought Inter Miami was erratic in the attack. I thought they were overzealous, like just just too too desperate, too frantic in terms of trying to get numbers forward. And like you said, there is a risk. But you have to try to minimize that risk. And I don't think Inter Miami did that. And I think that's why it's not and it's not just the third goal. It's not just the third goal. The first goal is another example. It's a it's a diagonal ball from Victor Ulloa out to Franco Negri, who's the left back, who's pushing forward into the attack. The diagonal ball gets intercepted, and in four passes, the ball's in the back of the net because there's just not enough coverage for Inter Miami. I think they've become so attack minded that they've left the defense exposed and vulnerable. That's and I think that's a big part of the issue in this game and what's become a, a bigger issue over the last three games, especially with Gregory out. Yes, it's, that is what I was going to say. It's going to keep being an issue because they have no replacement for Gregory. They have no replacement right now in the team. Yes, Victor Ulloa can play. Yes, Bryce Zuc can play there. They both bring different. Victor brings more defensive stability. He doesn't bring much of an attack. Bryce brings a little bit more of an attack, not much as a good defending, but you cannot get Gregore back with either of those two players, in either not David Ruiz also, because he's too young to take on that responsibility. So you don't have, you don't have. Um, Inter Miami needs to have a plan, especially for a player like Gregore. I don't think that can, they could can afford to wait until June to get someone. So I, I think that is uh, that is something that I, I am sure uh, the technical directors are, are thinking, and also Chris Henderson are think, is thinking in this moment. Well, let's not forget that Phil is on a one-year deal, and this is a different season for him, and it should be. Is he actually just like though? Is, just like just like it is for for Pizarro, right? I mean, he needs to perform. He needs to win games. So he needs to take risks. Because if not, he's going to be out of a job. I don't know if the plan is already to take him out. Because, like, to be honest, some of the things, and, and this is just a thought that, you know, we can, you know, keep just plugging in in the next few weeks and see how things shape up in terms of, like, okay, is the team going to get somebody to replace Gregory or... They're just going to, you know, wait it out and see how it goes with whatever they have available right now. That would be telling. Um, How much can you rely on the young guys consistently on bringing them over in the second half? That's another thing that, okay, is this a year to give an opportunity to the young guys or is this a year to win the league like they like to say every year? Um, there are little things, you know, that there are, the, 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 that I take them as signs of what the goals are really this year for Inter Miami. The decisions that the team makes from the start of the season, uh, as the season goes on, and you have challenges, and you have you need to find a way to approach them and and try to move past them. Those decisions tell you the story of what the goals really are for a team. So. I think for Phil, he needs to win. The only way that he's going to keep his job is by winning games. Jose. If he finishes seventh, eighth place, that might not be enough. Jose, what's better? A draw at home or a loss at home? No, against the Chicago Fire, I'll take the gamble. But at least give the players a chance. So if Phil is giving his players a chance to win, I'll take the loss. I'll take the loss. And maybe next time you get three points. And yeah, if the next time you're conservative and you get one point and for some reason it worked out and you got one point over the weekend against the Chicago Fire, that's two points. But if you're risky, if you take chances on one game, you get three, that will be one more than those two. Miami won games late last year. 
and and this this is the first obviously this is the one of this early in the season, but it's the first time that they've uh, lost the game late this season, especially at home. Bit of uh, tables have turned, roles have reversed a little bit. I still think they've become a little too offensive minded in general, and that's costing the defense. Like it's because Phil Neville said after the game, like all three errors plus the error in Toronto um, or one of the errors in Toronto. Uh, if not both, they're they're chalked up to individual errors. That's what he's chalking it up to. But if it's a bunch of different players having individual errors, then that's that's to me that's a reflection of the coach because it's it's not one player having breakdown after breakdown. It's it's multiple players. And look, there's absolutely mistakes made on all three goals from Inter Miami players. Like the 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 first goal, I don't know. Watch the replay. Go on YouTube right now and watch the replay. Pause this if you have to, but go watch the replay. I don't know what Christopher McVeigh is doing. I don't know why, instead of making the run backwards to cover the Chicago Fire striker, he se perfila mal. Like he, he positions himself awkwardly and runs diagonally towards goal instead of following the man. Then that pulls uh, Victor Ulloa out, and it just ends up being a bit of a mess. So yes, there are individual errors there. But if you're continuously having individual errors, then that's something that the coaching staff has to correct. I, second goal on McVeigh as well, by the way. No, second. I mean, to me, the second goal is on 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 Uyoa. To me, the second goal is on Uyoa because he doesn't. No, like, Franco, come on. please, no, man, watch, come on. Watch, they had watch, him. watch. He takes watch, the no. and takes the shot, and then they he gets the rebound and scores in the area. That is not Victor Uyoa's fault. Okay, so, For, forget so about the so second goal. The second goal comes off of a free kick. because we, we haven't described the, the goal. The second goal comes off a free kick that comes from Chicago Fire's left wing and Miami's right wing. And it goes to the far post. Victor Uyoa should be marking his man. And he doesn't. He ball watches the entire time, despite checking for the guy. He checks for the guy before the ball gets hit and sees that he's there, open. And instead of closing the space and getting tight on him, he ball watches, then tries to backtrack to win the header, misses the header attempt, and then that's where the dominoes start to fall. Can Christopher McVay do a better job? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the initial domino that falls is Victor Ulloa. I mean, the guy takes the shot right in front of him. Yeah. Right that's in front of him. Right in front of him. You're a, a center back. defender, yes. You're a center back. The, the one thing that you have to do is block shots, and the guy is taking the shot in front of you. He shot Block two that times. Shot. That's your two job. That, that's on my... Forget about what happened before. No, no, no. You yeah. can't forget about the build-up. No, yes, you, you have cannot Franco. forget about the first... He the, shot two one times. One breakdown leads to another. That's two times. One breakdown leads to another. He won the ball two times. You can't, for, you, so, can't, you can't just erase the first mistakes that lead to the eventual mistakes. No, man, no. It's like saying if the keeper... It's because someone loses the ball and the keeper should have gotten the ball. Instead, a goal was scored. It's the keeper's fault, even though someone lost the ball. Uh, I mean, depends on what context we're talking about. Is it an Alex Bono against Inter Miami type of blunder from the goalkeeper, or is it a, like it depends? Like, yeah, that I, need, I, need, I, need. I need more context than that. Well, that's different. That's completely different. It's the same. You, no. have, as a central defender, you cannot, you cannot let the central defender from the other team take two shots. He well, took two well, shots. The position from the other player. Just whoever gets the ball in front of you, just block the shot. Block the shot. Do whatever you have to do. I mean, there's not a lot of room. There's not a lot of places you can be. So if the ball is in front of you, the shot taker is in front of you, just go for it. That's that's the that's the one place you have to be, in front of the ball. Just, I mean, it, to me, it's pretty simple. McVeigh did not have a good game. McVeigh did not have a good game. But yeah, the, I think the, first, the first, the first, el primer error, the first mistake, if you're analyzing it, comes from Muyo. Absolutely. Now, but th think about this. Think about this for a second. Think about this for a second. We're early in the pod, and we already mentioned two players not having a good game. We said McVeigh not having a good game, Duke not having a good game, and then don't forget that Stefanelli was playing as a nine. Well, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. We're going no, to no, get no. there. I'm just. I just want to point this out just so that people understand that it, it just by those three facts, I mean, it, it would be really, really hard for Inter Miami to have a good night because you have one butt center back, bad center back, having a bad game, one key midfielder like Bryce Duke having a bad game, and you were basically playing without a nine. So find a way to succeed 
You know, if you know Inter Miami, you, you know, if that's happening within one game, you're in trouble. So, I mean, the, I think your point that you're making here, and that's, and it's, you know, in, in, in Spanish, you hear the saying a lot. The jugadores tienen que de seis puntos para arriba, right? Like, you need as many of the starting players to get, you know, on a... Of course, it's it's all subjective, but a subjective one through ten player rating. You need them to play six points and up. And Inter Miami definitely did not get that from enough players in this one. Performance levels were low, or lower than they've been. But we'll we'll get to Stefanelli in a second. We'll get to Stefanelli in a second because I just want to go into the overall game in general. Because listening to Stefanelli talk after the game, man, I, I could listen literally talk to him and listen to him talk about football for hours, hours. Porque tiene una riqueza cuando habla de fútbol. He has such a richness when he talks about, about the game and the way he analyzes it. And he said that the first half, Inter Miami settled for long balls way too often. And at one point, Phil Neville was very frustrated. I saw one long ball. I can't remember who, who hit it to Stefanelli. But Stefanelli, who's a diminutive attacker, not blessed with a whole lot of height, clearly was struggling to win those aerial balls and those 50-50s. And, and Chicago kept winning those balls and then attacking Inter Miami. Now, why did Inter Miami constantly go long? I agree with Stefanelli's analysis in that the fire pressed Inter Miami, and Inter Miami couldn't find that initial pass out from the back. Not 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 consistently enough. So they couldn't break the line, so they had to settle for long balls under pressure, and that played into the fire's hands because their two center backs, much larger than Stefanelli, constantly won them, and that's when Chicago started their possession or their spells of possession. So Again, we will get to Stefanelli playing as the nine, but I, I want to dive into post game, post game. So we're going to listen to a couple of quotes. First, from the Chicago Fire head coach Ezra Hendrickson, when I asked him, because listen, I don't believe. Uh, I mean, I do, but it depends on the situation. But I don't necessarily believe in coincidences all that much when it comes to professional sports. So I asked Ezra Hendrickson after the game, this. Two of your goals come from low crosses into the back post. Was that just a byproduct of what the game offered? Or was it something you guys studied and analyzed? Up some, in some, something we worked on. We noticed that once the ball got on the wing in their final uh, third, when they're in the box, they get a little narrow. And they always leave the back post. We saw a couple times when uh, Toronto and I think it was Philly played back post uh, crosses. And they didn't get goals, but we knew that's something that we could exploit. So we made sure we told our weak side winger, whenever we're crossing, you make sure you get in. You know, someone has to get the back post. Um, and two or three occasions tonight, we had that, and we got got it to the guy a couple of times. Um, so that's something that we, we notice uh, as far as their back foot, how narrow they get once they're in their, their box defended. Okay, so Hendrickson says something they practice, something they worked on during the week. I then, during Inter Miami's post-game press conference with Phil Neville, towards the end, I ask him, well, I tell him, I inform him that Ezra Hendrickson said this. I summarize what Ezra Hendrickson said. And then I ask him, Phil Neville, I ask, what is the way to counteract that? How do you counter this when your back line's getting narrow and low crosses are coming into the back line? A very defiant Phil Neville said the following. Oh, that, that, that's bullshit, really. I think, <laughs> I honestly think it is because I think uh, you just got to defend. You, you think about the first goal; it, was, it had nothing to do with the way that we defend. The last goal had nothing to do with the way they defend. So, uh, I think that's bullshit. Okay, so we've heard both head coach quotes. I'm going to break my rule of cursing on the podcast, or not cursing on the podcast, to ask you guys the following question. What do you make of those comments from Phil Neville in response to Ezra Hendrickson? Do you agree that it's bullshit or is it bullseye? Jose. I think that's a typical Phil reaction after losing a game. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm not surprised at all. I think, you know, that's, that's just typical Phil. I mean, we, we have known the guy for a while now here. Um, we know exactly the way he is when he wins. And then, you know, he gets frustrated of obviously like any other coach. Um, I think they might be, uh, something into it. I think, you know, I, I, I choose to believe Hendrickson this time, 
but uh, um, I don't expect Phil to come out and say, well, yes, he's absolutely right, and he got us this time. So, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm not surprised. I, 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 I side with, with the Chicago Fire here. Okay, so before I get to Andrea, because there's, let's 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 try to paint a rounded picture here and be fair to both coaches, right? That's, that's our job as media members, because I see two scenarios potentially here happening. Either one, Phil Noble is spot on in saying that low crosses to the back post had you know that that's that's BS, that's nonsense, and Ezra Hendrickson is just taking credit for a natural cause and effect of the game something that just happened naturally during the flow of the match he's taking credit by saying that they worked on that in practice when that's not the case i mean that could that could possibly be a realistic scenario right now there's the other scenario and it's the one that i think is actually true and is that i think chicago fire did see that on film they did analyze that they did work on that whether it was to a great extent or, or small extent, I don't know. But it's something that they noticed and they worked on. Now, is that the reason these goals happen? I can understand Phil Neville saying that that's nonsense. I can understand that because, again, this is these are low crosses that, yes, they do go towards the back post and they're low on the ground as opposed to high up in the air. And they come after some poor defending, Right. So I think what Phil was trying to say is that it's not their collective defending that's been an issue, or that was an issue in this game, but it was rather individual defending. So I think that's the point Phil was trying to make. But I still think Ezra Henderson's overall point that Inter Miami has a weakness there, I think that still stands. I absolutely still think that that is something that they have to work on and address. And I think Phil Neville, once the heat of the moment passed, and once he sat down uh, with his coaching staff to go over the film and, and talk about things... I think he would acknowledge that. I think so. I mean, if the other coach is saying he trained on it, I mean, is, is the other coach really lying just to, to win a few brownie points in terms of, you know, the fans <laughs> and, and, and just, like, you know, saying something publicly in front of the media? Like, I mean, I guess that's a possibility, but yes. I'm sure that they I'm sure that they worked on that. I'm sure that they worked on that, and, and I think that that is an issue because I, I've told you for weeks now. And it goes back to a conversation I had with another media member not too long ago. And it was more specifically for DeAndre Yedlin, but DeAndre Yedlin's reactionary. He's not an anticipating defender, right? He doesn't read the game that well to anticipate the play. He reacts to the play. Usually his elite speed and athleticism allows him to recover or allows him to recover often, but not always. So that's definitely, definitely one area that I think Inter Miami is, is not the best at. Look, that Toronto FC goal, you can talk about the first goal, you can talk about the mistake or whatever. It's, a, it's again, on a low cross, that one to, and DeAndre Allen wasn't involved in that play, but Harvey Neville's marking uh, the, the Jonathan Osorio, and he doesn't get there. Uh, Jonathan Osorio beats him to the spot. And it's another low cross. So it's, it's now become a pattern. So I agree with Ezra Hendrickson. That's an Inter Miami weakness that they have to correct. And I think Phil Neville is just in the, in the heat of the moment not willing to to hear what's the actual criticism of the of the team and analysis of how the team plays. Andrea, your thoughts quickly here on, on Phil Neville's post-game remarks. I agree with Estra. Listen, I, I told you that I think Miami lost his games because of the tactics of, that the coach uh, put forward. And um, I agree that he simply studied film. It's not that difficult to see, which is the weakness that the, this defense have. So I agree with him. He took advantage of that, and they won the game. Uh, I understand Phil also getting mad. We know him. We know how he reacts, not only with the coach, maybe sometimes with even his own players. So it's not something new. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, like, funny, ironically, because I don't think Ezra was lying. I, I, I think that he, he deservedly studied his rival and then got two goals in that manner and, and they won the, the three points. So right, And it makes sense because Yedlin and, and, and Franco Negri are tasked with moving so far into the attack, especially Negri, especially Negri, so tasked with moving into the attack that they can't, yeah. they can't track back always and, and cover the back post. And, and, the, and he, that's a weakness and that is something that the other teams can expose if they're sharp enough, good enough, and have enough quality in the final third. 
Now again, exactly. I, I, I don't think you expect that. I don't think you necessarily now from Inter Miami for for their 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 two defenders, their two laterales to move forward. So all teams in MLS know that that is the way Miami plays. So they are going to take advantage. They go, they are going to take advantage. They're going to have to make adjustments. And Miami's going to have to make adjustments with that. And again, that's why I'm saying I think they become too attack minded, too much because it's no, leaving them exposed at the back. The problem is that when Yellin and Negri went forward in the first games, you had Gregore staying with the two defenders. Now you don't have Gregore, and you have a big problem. I think they're going to have to make some adjustments, tweak some things, and and maybe not have them push so far forward. Probably Yedlin less so than than. Uh, Negri or have Negri, you know, not not defend as much and let him go higher because he's just more technical and uh, more of a threat than DeAndre Yedlin is, even with Yedlin's speed and experience. So, but I do think adjustments will have to be made there for Inter Miami to start uh, avoiding more of these type of low cross goals. Okay, let's quickly because we have we have still to preview this upcoming weekend's game, but we've got to talk about a couple more items regarding this match. And let's talk about Franco Negri, because he was a positive. He was a bright spot in this one. A goal and an assist. His first goal is exquisite. He brings down a great diagonal ball from Gene Mota. The first touch and the control is sublime. And then he outside foots it to the back post from the left side of the penalty area. Heck of a way to open the Inter-Miami account. And I think what gave them a lifeline in a game in which it wasn't looking too good for them. And then that helped Inter-Miami in the second half. Be the, the protagonistas, be the team that was on top, that was pushing the game forward, that was dictating the tempo, and they got their equalizer with Stefanelli. Very quickly, your thoughts on Franco Negri's overall game, especially his attacking contributions. Well, you know, I've been talking about Franco Negri for a while now, and I've been saying that he is a very good player. And um, I think, you know, obviously now he gets the attention because of the goal, which is quite a beauty of a goal um but i think you know he's he's the one player that if he can be consistent and he can and if he can play at, at a high level he's going to really really help this team um i think if you get two or three more players in your starting 11 that can actually um you know take negative example and and just do the little things right then it doesn't matter what uh, what was the last name in the back of the jersey you're going to have a good team you know those are the players that you want starting those are the players that you want consistently um working for you and i would say this i think this is just the start i think negative will get better than what we've seen so far so um i just you know obviously a bright spot for the team um but I'm sure at the end of the day, he, he'll change his goal and, and the assist and, and everything that we say about him individually to have a better performance collectively. And with his individual performance, he was the latest Inter Miami player this season named to the MLS team of the match day. So he made the, the cut for the best Which 11. Means <laughs> it, means means it means something. It means something. It means something. Nothing. It means he, it means he had a good game. Now listen, and if he, and it starts to give him some recognition when he's still a relative unknown in yeah, MLS. but he'll, he, he, he will course. not get the team of the week when he plays good defense. It's only because he scored. So forget it. It means absolutely true, nothing. True. True. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. If the goalkeeper could score, the goalkeeper that scored <laughs> would get him team of the week. So forget it. That's. Fair point. Uh, okay. Fair point. The MLS, the MLS way. The MLS. I understand your point. I understand your point. Look, I'll say this about him: I did not think he had the best game defensively, but in the attack, again, showing his technical qualities, showing the threat he can be to the Inter Miami attack. Now, towards the 65th minute, I agree with you, Jose. There's more to come from him, but towards the 65th minute, he was already exhausted. Done. Done. I think he pushed on for another 10, 15 minutes. But he was exhausted. You can see it on one on one clip where he's, uh, you know, he's got his hands on his knees after uh, after a play uh, goes away from the left side and back towards the middle and then towards the right. You can see it on the broadcast. He gets his hands on his knees. There's also the play where he sets up a low cross uh, in from the left, and when Stefanelli can't pull the trigger fast enough, this is in the second half. Uh, Franco Negri just kind of crumbles to the ground, like you know, falls to his knees and then face first into the ground. Just which to me showed, uh, you know, one, both frustration and two, exhaustion. I think he's he is being pushed to the absolute limit physically in terms of what he's used to and capable of in terms of his ability to project forward and get back, 
right? He's got to play two ways, and I think le está costando a little bit. Like it's, it's not the easiest thing for him to do. I think you know with time and with more uh, repetition and more games, I think he, his fitness levels will probably improve and he'll be able to do more of it. But right now, they're asking a whole lot out of Franco Negri. But good performance in the attack, not so great on the on the defensive side. But overall, you know he get he's one of the players that I think he gets above a six if I was doing a player rating. So last talking point here, and then we'll combine two players, but it starts with Nicola Stefanelli, who gets his first goal with a, a snap header to the back post off of Franco Negri cross. They equalize the game. But he started this game as a 9. That goal came with him playing as the 10. Did Inter Miami, did Phil Neville make a mistake? And yes, his options were limited, but he, did he make a mistake by starting Stefanelli at the 9? Back to you, Andrea. I think he had to try it for this game because Leo is injured. Uh, Borgelin was is still not 100%. And, and uh, Joseph was in interna- on international duty, so he had to try it. Uh, he, Stefanelli scored a lot of goals in his time in Sweden. Um, so it was worth a shot because of the possibilities that uh, he had. It didn't work out. Um, I don't think not because Stefanelli is not talented, but because of the formation, the players that were available, it didn't work out. Um, I think he played a little bit better when he changed to, uh, to playing on the sides, him on one side and Ali Lassiter on the other side mm-hmm. in the second half. Um, I don't think uh, it, him playing as a nine was a mistake. Um, I, I see it more like the whole tactical unit for him being the night was a mistake because it clearly didn't work out. It didn't work out. He changed it during the first half, then he changed it for the second half. But I couldn't say it was a mistake given the options, the limited options that he had. He he was one of the two that could could have gone with that position. Uh, the other one was uh, uh, Coco. But, I, think, I think Lasseter could have gotten a look. I think Lasseter's yeah, not Lass- a nine, but he could have gotten a look. Yeah, but you you Ste- had Ste- you know and the Stefanelli for me, he's I like some of the movements he had up there and and the ability he had to stretch and and test the back line with runs in behind that we haven't really seen from Joseph Martinez so far. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But he's not the biggest dude in a league that's yeah, very that is physical the, exactly. and and that eso lo co- le costó Inter Miami. That was that was very very clear and evident that it was costly to enter Miami in that first half. There's one play in the first half, which is a throw-in, and I believe Franco Negri takes it from the left, and he throws it to Stefanelli, and Stefanelli looks at the center back, which I think was uh, was the Colombian that scored, uh, Tarang, and he tries to you know shield himself and, and, and brace for the contact. But in doing so, he doesn't look at the ball anymore, and then the ball goes away from him, and he, he, he takes the, the collision and... and and that's and that's it. The, the ball, the the play went to waste. The whole sequence went to waste. So they lost possession like that. And no es un jugador que va uh, que le gusta friccionar because he just doesn't have that build, right? He's not big enough to really want to go into uh, shoulder to shoulder battles with six foot two, three four uh, center backs, right? He's not going to be a, a physical contact type of striker. Now, does that mean he can't be a striker and score goals? No, absolutely. If you know you're good enough, you can do it. But in this league and with his qualities, I don't think. In this game, it was it was the right choice. I think Lassiter or I mean I, we, have, we haven't really seen Coco Jean there, so I can't even say Coco Jean. But I think even Lassiter, who's not a natural number nine, someone who could give you a little bit more physicality up there, I think that, that would have been better suited for Inter Miami. Now I don't think um, you know it's the last we've probably seen of him up there, but I think that there'll be it will take a lot to see Stefanelli back up top as as the nine. Unless something, you know, as a low number nine, right? Because as, as a second number nine, where you can play off of somebody, you know, all the attention is not on you from the two center backs. But when you're one, when you're alone up there by yourself, you know, it, it, for someone like Stefanelli, it's going to be very, very tough. Especially if you're playing, trying to play the ball into his feet, you know, with his back to goal as opposed to with him facing the opposing goal. But Jose, any any thoughts? So of course, Borgelin wasn't, you know, he, he was back in this one, but he's not at 100% fitness after just returning from injury. So he couldn't start. But I thought Inter Miami improved a good bit. I would almost say miles better once they had a bruiser up there that could challenge the, the fire center backs and they dropped Stefanelli to the 10. I agree with Andrea, though, that I, I thought Stefanelli was very, very interesting once he was playing on the wing. I think that could be the long-term solution for him. 
Yeah, I, I, I would say it was a mistake to uh, to give uh, Stefanelli an opportunity as a nine, just because you have uh, Adi Lassiter waiting for an opportunity. Um, if you tell Adi Lassiter, um, you you have a chance this weekend. You think he won't be ready? I think he'll be ready to compete. I think he'll be ready for those 90 minutes. And um, the the other reason why I would I would go with Ari Lassiter as a nine is because the midfield worked previously with uh, Coco and, um, and, and Stefanelli. So why change that? Why change that? Because Joseph Martinez hasn't scored a goal, and yet you won two games. So, I mean, just give Ari Lester an opportunity. Um, you know, maybe he's having a good day or, or you just have to trust him that, you know, he's waiting for an opportunity. And, you know, the mental side of the game sometimes should play a factor as well. So I thought it was a mistake. You know, I understand the reasoning behind it. But, but in the end, um, I thought it was a mistake because uh, uh, to me, it's definitely just didn't look comfortable there. Right, and 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 that's where I go back to the point that you know they they that first half just in general was not good enough for Inter Miami. And I think Phil Neville was was out coached just because of some of the lineup decisions he made and and some of the tactics overall. Yeah, but, but, it's that feel when he marries to a formation, he tries it until he <laughs> he loses five in has, a row. I don't think he has a lot of choices when it comes to the formation right now because, you know, the diamond is pretty much out of the picture because he doesn't have two strikers. Well, that might change yeah. this weekend. That might change this weekend because Leonardo Campana is expected to potentially be in uniform and Joseph Martinez is back from international duty scoring a goal. So let's go towards this weekend's game for Inter Miami. On Saturday night, they travel to take on FC Cincinnati in another road match. And this one will be a decent challenge because FC Cincinnati is currently in second place in the Eastern Conference with three wins, two draws, zero losses. They've scored seven goals, given up four. It's going to be a tough test for Inter Miami. It's going to be a tough challenge. Yes, Campana might be back in uniform. Joseph Martinez should have some confidence after scoring on international duty. Robert Taylor is also back. Team is a little healthier. And Brandon Buck will have a party. Well, that's a, let's <laughs> let's start. Let's start there then. Let's start there. Jose, <laughs> what is the key to the game for Inter Miami in this one? What do they have to do well to get something? Right? A, a win well, would be would be great because no, it helps it make up it helps make up for the home loss and the dr- points that mm. they've just dropped but even a draw i think yeah. i think you take a draw, a draw if you can get a draw man. right a so, draw is the so what do they have to do well what do they have to do well is it defend brandon vasquez yeah they have to play defense they just have to play defense you know they have to get back to you know the old Phil, the Phil that you know played with five in the back although he never admitted it to playing with five <laughs> in the back um, i mean yeah, I think that's the way to do it. You know, th- there are games in which, you know, you really have to go for it. Like, you know, last uh, weekend against Chicago, yeah, you have to go for it. And then there are some other games where you have to realize, okay, we're on the road. We usually struggle uh, on the road against the worst teams in the league. It doesn't really matter. Once we're out of Fort Lauderdale, it's, pr- it's trouble. So you have to recognize that. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the quote that you, you talked about early on in the pod about at least getting a draw, it was Phil referring to, referring to the idea that, you know, when you go on the road, sometimes just not losing the game is good news. And I think that applies to this game. Cincinnati is doing really well to start, and, you know, it's MLS, and I think it can happen. It's up and down. But I think right now, because of how, how Inter-Miami is right now in terms of, you know, it, injuries and and we just haven't been able to see the full potential of the team i think you go on the road you get a point and then you come home and and move on i think it's it's going to be a very difficult game for them and fc cincinnati's coming off of a one to zero so a clean sheet victory on the road against nashville sc which is not the easiest place to go in and, and get some points but like you said it is mls so you know things happen but you know they've got they've got quite uh a 
three-headed monster up top with Brenner. Yeah. Not Steven Primo Brenner, who we miss dearly, but Brenner. Uh, Brandon who Vasquez. Who traveled to, to Inter Miami last year, if you right. remember. And so they've got Brenner, Brandon Vasquez, who's drawing interest from Borussia Mönchengladbach in, in Germany. According to reports, Luciano Lucho Acosta. You know, they've got Matt Miazga, who I know you guys are a great, great, great appreciation. Uh, well, that's, that's not the word I was going for, but great fans of. Uh, I know that's just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but they've, they've got some talent on that roster. They have some Diego Arias, too. Exactly. They've got the Colombian Santiago Arias, although he did not start in, in the last game, the the Colombian uh, right back. So they've got they've got some good good weapons. Uh, and they've got some interesting pieces there. So, Andrea, key to the game. What does it remind me have to do well on Saturday to get something out of this one? Defend. I agree with Jose. They have to defend, especially um, the the back line, that back four ha- has to do better, and the, maybe the player that is going to replace Gregore, I'm guessing it's going to be Victor Ulloa, needs to do a little bit better. Uh, they need to be defensive minded for this team because if not, if they play as open as they did in the first half against Chicago, against this Cincinnati team, they could come home. They could come back with a lot of goals uh, against. So they need to defend well. They need to be intelligent. And um, maybe we can see a couple of changes. Maybe we can see a couple of changes. Uh, but Inter Miami needs to prioritize defending for this match because if not, as I said, I think they could come with a lot of goals in their bag. So I will say, while I agree that defending is important, I think Inter Miami needs to score in this one to get something out of it. I don't think they're shutting out FC Cincinnati at home. So I think someone needs to score. And for me, that someone needs to be Joseph Martinez. He needs to score. He's coming off of a, a game. Uh, well, he played two games for Venezuela, but again, he scored in one that should boost his confidence, have him in better spirits. He needs to deliver. It's time for him to deliver. He needs to get on the score sheet. If you know one or two, whatever, he just needs to get on there. I think if they can score one, then maybe they can hold Cincinnati to one, and they can get out of there with a point and, and a one-one draw. I think that is the key to the game. I don't think that they're going to hold Cincinnati completely scoreless. Uh, regardless of, of how they line up and regardless of who plays. Now, very quickly, and we'll close out the first segment, any lineup changes, any predictions for what we could see? I think Joseph Martinez comes in. I think you'll still see the 4 2 three, one. Possibly, possibly, there's a chance, I think, of them switching to the back five. I think there's a good chance. But I'll say 4 2 three, one. Joseph Martinez starts. I think Stefanelli goes to the ten. I think you've got Bryce Duke come out. No, I think up. yeah, I think I think Pizarro starts on one wing and I think we could see Ariel Lasseter on the on the opposite side. Because Coco Jean and we can talk about this next week on the pod, to me he's just not showing enough. Not showing enough. Yeah, he scored a good goal in the in the season opener, but not he's not getting a whole lot of touches. I've looked at the numbers. He's just not getting anywhere near as involved as, as you need him. I don't think he's giving you all that much. So in a game like this where you might have to defend a little more Get Ari Lasseter in there with his with his uh, work rate and as well his his speed for the counter. Um, so I think that could be a change. I think you got to go Uyoa and Mota in the midfield, and then if you're sticking with that back four, you know it's the usual suspects: Yedlin and, and Negri as, as the fullbacks, Kristoff and uh, and McVay at center back with three calendar goal. So I say four two three one, but I think Joseph Martinez comes in. I think Ari Lasseter comes in as well. Andrea, quickly, your thoughts for the lineup. Yeah, I think Joseph definitely will come back in. I think we're going to see Victor again uh, replacing Gregory in the starting lineup. And um, I don't think Ariel is going is going to come uh, to start this game. I think he's going to stick it with uh, Corentin Jean and uh, Pizarro on the other side. And then Stefan Elias at 10, the, the player that is going to come out is going to be Bryce Duke and he's going to be replaced by uh, Joseph Martinez. Then I don't think he changes it. I would like for him to change it, like you said, with Ariel Lassiter. That is a possibility that he has. Um, maybe we could see Borgelin starting with, through Joseph Martinez in this game. I I don't think so, but uh, they need to defend. So I don't think he's going to change anything. And I don't think we are going to see the back five again because 
that would be very, very, very risky <laughs> uh, to do it against a team that is um, having a good run like Cincinnati is having. Jose, quickly, and we'll end the first segment. I would say he's going to go with five in the back. Ooh, okay. Wow. I, I think I think he'll change things. I think he'll recognize that, you know, there's... He'll recognize the BS? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, you know, he needs to do something different that, you know, he needs to gain, get a hold of his team once again because re- really think about this. And and this is something that I that I that we were talking with Andrea after after the match on on Saturday. Um, Inter Miami talked about a good start, right? Phil talked about a good start. Winning two out of the first five when you lost uh, the other three, is that a good start, really? How about going two out of the first six? Would that be a good start? Would that be good enough? So, you know, to play it safe, if you get a draw against Cincinnati, it's a good result. We start forgetting about the last two matches, especially the last one at home, the last three matches, especially the one against the Fire. I think he's going to play it safe. I think he's going to play it safe. Who comes um, in? Who's the Who's the third center back? Uh, well, he center backs, he has options. But, but I'm uh, asking you who comes in, right? Because you're, you're switching. Sailor, I think Sailor would be agreed. I mean, Sailor, a better option than Mavica. And then, you know, you give opportunities to Negri and Yetlin to be a little bit more aggressive through the wings. So I think it could work out if you're looking for a counter attack type of game, right? You know, you're not going to have possession. But you're hoping for one or two chances and maybe you score on one of them and you come out of there with a draw. So you, you think you would play with a double five, like we would say in Spanish, un doble cinco. Well, in, with, in English, you'd be saying, because see, the, it gets confusing because well, like, the way in the United States, they say the six instead of the five. The five is in mm-hmm. Espanol. I know it depends on where, you know, where, how you were raised, you know, with the game. So you're talking about two defensive midfield. That's what I was going to ask Jose. So it's five at the back and are you saying three, two? Or are you saying two in the midfield, three up top? How, how does Inter Miami go about it? It's got to be three two, right? I, yeah, yeah. I I think that's the way. To, listen, it's going to be conservative. It's going to be conservative. Okay, so give me that midfield three. Who's the midfield three then in your formation that you're predicting? I I think obviously Mota will be there. Right. Mota, I think he's playing at a very high level. So yes. Yeah. So there's no doubt about it. I think you bring Pizarro in, mm-hmm. of course, because he's your DP. And and I think you give an opportunity to to Stefanelli, so that's that's your. But remember, that this, is wishful thinking, Jose. If Jose, he go, yeah, he goes to defend. He's going. Yeah, to play you gotta get a yo in there, man. Uh, doble cinco, yes. Oh, definitely. No, no, no. I don't know if you need no. doble cinco, but you definitely need one cinco. And Jose gave us no cincos. Cinco. He's gonna fit Pizarro if he plays with back five. He's gonna seek Pizarro. Cinco, I would bet ten dollars right now. Cinco gave us no cincos in his back yes. in his back cinco. <laughs> My cinco would be Mota. My single will be Mota. See, you guys give a lot of credit to Mota, but I don't think there's there's the, the only difference between, well, it's a big difference, by the way, <laughs> between Mota and Gregory. It's two things, you know. Mota is a little bit better with the ball. A little bit? Coming from the back. Yeah, he's better than, than Gregory. And then, but he's not as good defending. As when it comes defense. to the defensive effort, when it comes to the defensive effort, Gregory is a little bit more aggressive, but Mota can do that job if he, if he has help. He has help. So, and who's well, going to help him? Estefanelli and Pizarro. Estefanelli and Pizarro <laughs> help out. I don't, I don't oh. see that. I don't see that. But Jose, okay, continue. So who's up top then? Who's up top? Who starts up top? Yeah, I'm not saying it's my, it's my, this is my idea. You guys can, like, <laughs> Who I, starts up top? Jose, let's go. Let's go. Then uh, at the top, I'll go Young with um, Borgelin and Joseph. Okay. All right. I, so that, that would, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why I would do it. Because Borgelin will help you in set pieces. And if you have one chance of scoring against Cincinnati, it's on set pieces. And so you give an opportunity to Joseph to play alongside somebody else. You don't put a lot of weight on Borgelin because Inter Miami is not going to have a lot of possession. So, you know, he's going he's gonna to fight. He's going to run. He's going to press. 
He's going to be a presence on set pieces. So he can help you because the load of the game is not on him. Right? Because Joseph will be next to him. So the idea would be to have Pizarro and Stefanelli in the middle, but not to be overly aggressive and every time they have the ball looking to score, but to defend with the ball. I think... To understand that Mota needs help. First off, you need to play good D. Once you have the ball, don't give it away. Give your defenders a breather. You know, look for the wings where Negri will be moving forward and Yetlin on the right side. I think that's a very conservative setup. And I think that's what Inter Miami needs. I think your lineup, your your like I, I could see the five three two. I could see that happening this weekend, like I said before. But I think your lineup and your idea falta coherencia. Like it's not it's not a coherent game plan because you've got five defenders, but you have no defensive midfielder in the middle of the park. If, 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 he's not, a, but he's not a defensive midfielder. Jose, he's not a def- his his strengths aren't on the defensive side of the ball. His strengths are with the ball. The way it's he passes, gra- the way he shoots. It will be not crazy. I think it will be not crazy because it will be a balanced team. But I consider it crazy because Phil will never do it. It's not. If it's Phil not a balanced team. It's not a balanced team. It, it, no, I think it could be a balanced team because with Pizarro and Stefanelli, you can keep no, them. See, ball. No, I, I would say I say look, if they go five through two, if we're borrowing Jose's uh, formation here, because I already said four two three one, if we're borrowing Jose's formation, I think it's Uyoa, Pizarro. Mota in that midfield. Uyoa as the six. Up top, I think you have Stefanelli and Joseph Martinez. Stefanelli, again, now he doesn't have to be the one winning the, the 50-50s and the aerial balls. He can kind of win the second balls as Joseph Martinez battles for him. And then you have two strikers that can combine on the ground quickly if they need to. I think that's how they go if they go 5-3-2. You've got a good defensive core, which is the whole point of going to the back five. But you've also got some some speed down the wings, uh, you know, with... Uh, one on DeAndre Yedlin. Negri, not the fastest, but technically he's good and can get forward. And then you've got some some midfield talent that can get the ball forward. And you've got two two attackers that can combine and help make the deal. I think that's what you see if they go 5-3-2. We'll see on Saturday night, and we'll see how Inter-Miami does. All right, we've talked for a while. Let's take a break here on the first segment. We'll come back for a quick Q&A, final thoughts, and we'll do that after this. <laughs> Q&A time, very quickly, we'll just tackle a couple. And one is from Doe Snows, who I have to give props to because while we're rotating, he is adamant to send one in every single week. So props to Doe Snows for being an active and involved listener of Miami Dodan Football Radio. All right, Doe Snows says, doesn't look like Messi is coming anymore. If not, what other big name player will be available? Also, will Phil go away with this 4-2-3-1 formation after the three straight losses? So we just talked on the formation part. I guess we could talk about what other big name player if you guys want to speculate a little bit, or unless you guys have heard something. I have not heard anything besides you know the messy murmurs. So I guess it's speculation time. What big name player could we see if it's not Messi Busquets. this summer? Busquets. Well, there was talk about Busquets, which I don't know if you know at this point it's a big time player. But um, the other name that I heard was um, Di Maria. So Interesting. maybe. You know, with uh, another if, one, <laughs> if his contract, if his if his contract is is up, um, yeah, his contract is up. That is why he's getting <laughs> the, the the rumors are starting because his contract is up with Juventus. I don't, I don't think with the sanctions, I, I, I don't know, I don't. Know. Well, they have, they they can bring one. Yeah, they can bring one, but they can bring only one. Remember. Yeah, but I mean, they mm-hmm. can. If yeah, they has, okay. if there's room for one, I, I honestly I wouldn't go for Busquets. I think that's I think everybody knows except for Inter Miami that that's not a good idea. Well, I think yeah. I think Busquets is only coming if Messi's coming. Like I think it's a joint package. I don't think it's one. Mm, I don't think so because he he since last year since Messi left and uh, Barcelona he wanted to come. He said he wanted yeah, to come. Yeah, but I don't think Miami Messi. brings him unless unless Messi's coming because I, I think you know they want to help Messi feel comfortable and you know etc cetera, etc cetera, give him you know someone that he's that he's familiar with and 
Uh, I've with... always, I, I, I wanted to say, I've always said Messi is not coming, especially after winning the World Cup. I think people still telling you that Messi is coming are lying to you. They're not vending the humo. They're selling smoke. Yes. Uh, I don't. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. I think there is a chance. I think there's... Messi is coming, but listen, not now. Listen, not if we saw if we saw Jorge Mas in and around his entourage during the World Cup final, in and around their suite, I think that tells you something. Inter Miami also isn't selling tickets uh, for the regular season beyond June, if I'm not mistaken. I think that also tells you something. That number 10 and that number 5, which could go to Messi and Busquets, I said could, I think that also tells you something. I think there's a chance he can come. I think there's a realistic chance he could come. Will he come? I have no freaking clue. It's up to Messi and his family, but I think that there is a chance. I think there is a, a real chance. I, I, does it happen? We'll see. We'll see. But I think there's a real chance. Uh, what other big name could come if not Messi? I don't know if they go big name. If, if they can't land Messi, I think they go for a number 10. And that might not be a big name. Might be someone from South America who's a relative unknown, and they just bring that player on board. That's what I think we could see. Jose, any, any other name you want to mention? No, no. I, I, that's the only thing I heard, Di Maria. That's the one name that that I heard as a possibility. Not not uh not James Rodriguez who told you uh, last year that uh, he's not ready <laughs> yeah. to come to, to MLS because he's to not retire. He, essentially right. He's not ready. He's not at that point in his career where he uh he should be coming to South Florida and in, Inter Miami. Uh, one more question, which we'll just touch on uh, and and just really. We've already dove into it quite a bit, but it comes from Roberto Rivadeneira, and he says, wasn't sure what Yedlin's role was because goal one and three came from lack of defensive presence on his usual position, especially in the third goal, you see Kamara easily entering the area and scoring, and Yedlin rushing from midfield. Lack of defense on that position. So I've touched on that in good detail here. I think, you know, one, he was exhausted. Two, he's being asked to push forward, and of course, that's going to leave spaces in behind. I think Inter Miami is lacking a little bit of balance in terms of when one pushes and the uh, when fullback pushes and the other one stays. And I think they've become a little bit too aggressive, a little too uh, attack minded, and they've lost their balance at the back. So we'll just leave it there. That will do it for the Q and A session. Our final thoughts. I already have a great feeling that I know what Jose is going to say. So we'll start with you, Jose, then Andrea, then myself. Go ahead. Yes, David Ruiz. That's my final thought. The Honduran finally made his debut with Inter Miami. Um, I would say this. I would say this because I have to be honest. I've always been on. I've always been honest here in the pod, and it doesn't matter the nationality of the player. I'm really happy for him. I'm really happy for him. But I think you know the team needs to take it slowly with him. You cannot put so much responsibility on such a young player. I think he has a, a ways to go in terms of development. I think he has ways to go in terms of what his full potential will be. I think he's a good player. I'm very happy for him. And of course, he's Honduran and want him to play with the Honduran under-20s, which he was called up, by the way. And uh, he decided to... He asked for permission to the head coach so that he could play over the weekend. Honduras had a couple of friendlies against the Dominican Republic. So I'm very happy for him, but I just hope that they can take him slowly and give him enough time to continue to develop. I thought initially that this year would be another year for him in, um, in MLS Next Pro, but it looks like he's taking that next step. I just hope it's not because the team wants to rush him into something that he's not right now. And at some point, they can realize that he still needs more time to continue to develop. But I'm happy. I'm happy for him. Such a such a Honduran point of view. And I do think he deserved to mention, but such a Honduran point of view. Like, they need to bring him along slowly, blah, blah, blah. That's because you're thinking bigger picture for the Honduran national team and, and overall his, his career. Listen, I think he's, I I think he he's just a stopgap. He, he a, can't be a starter. Just because he's an Inter Miami player, he's not an automatic starter in the Honduran national team. Okay, but the, he's I, far away from being sure, a starter. Sure, but yeah, but I, I know where that's coming from. I know where your where your statement and your overall final point is coming from. Listen, he was on a short term loan for a one game, and he came off the bench and made his debut. And I don't think I don't think he looked bad. I think he looked you know like the part. He looked like he could play in an MLS uh, game. 
But I think he's so far from being a regular contributor. I think he was just, because of the situation Inter Miami was in, he had to be part of the part of the equation in this one particular match. Andrea, your final thought. Well, my final thought has something to do with with the under 20s because today it was announced by FIFA that it will not be played in Indonesia like it was scheduled to to be played because of the turmoil and what happened with the stampedes and all the unfortunate killings and all of the things that is, are happening in Indonesian football. So uh, FIFA announced today that it was not going to be played there, but um, rumors are saying that it could be played in Argentina, but Inter Miami is going to have a lot of representatives there. We have talked about David Ruiz, but then you have uh, also uh, Edison Ascona from the first team, who is the captain for the Republica Dominicana. You have also uh, Israel Boltwright, who is in the Dominican Republic. And if uh, the tournament is moved to Argentina, then Cremarchi who had an opportunity and did not stay with the Argentina under under 20 team could also be an option for for the host the new host of the tournament so it could be interesting for Inter Miami and it could be interesting and a good proof that their academy is uh, bringing and working, uh, bringing up these youngsters that can go and represent their countries and begin to represent their countries in, in an important tournament as the Under-20 World Cup is because we've seen it. Messi won it. Uh, uh, all the German guys that were world champions in 2014 won it before. And that is the first step on becoming a regular starter for your national team. So it would be um, good for Inter Miami to have all those representatives there, so, and it would be great if the tournament is played in Argentina. Did you say no, Alan? Did you mention no, Alan? If he gets healthy? I don't know if you mentioned uh, no, no, I didn't mention no, Alan, Alan because he's injured and he was not called up the last call-up, so... Well, that's because he's injured, well, no. but, but if he gets healthy, then probably back in the, in the picture. Uh, all right, so my final thought, and I'm not going to get bushy or, or sad here, but it's been a year now wildly enough since my dad passed so um it was a rough day for me but uh you know still miss my dad dearly and deeply um love you pops uh miss you uh and that's it that's my final thought so we will end on that note and we will be back next week to recap and uh rewind and analyze the game against fc cincinnati as well as preview what is to come for Inter Miami. So for Jose Armando, for Andrea Yanes, I am Franco Penizo. You have been listening to Miami Total Football Radio. We'll talk to you guys again. <laughs>